the Center for Prevention, we are funded from the proceeds of Blue Cross's historical settlement with the commercial tobacco industry, and we use these resources to help fight health inequities in Minnesota. Addressing the harms caused by commercial tobacco is core to our work. While the overall smoking rate in Minnesota has dramatically decreased, commercial tobacco use remains one of the leading causes of death and disease. Marketing of these products continues to cause more destruction for communities of color, American Indians, immigrants, and refugees. Throughout its history, the commercial tobacco industry has been misrepresenting and appropriating American Indian traditions, values, and beliefs to market and sell their products. It's a direct assault on American Indian culture, traditions, and practices. We have had the privilege to work with tribal communities to help reduce harm caused by commercial tobacco, and we are grateful for what we've learned along the way. Understanding the difference between commercial tobacco and sacred tobacco is critically important for shifting the dominant narrative around tribal communities and their health. In the next three episodes of The State We're In, we'll explore how honoring sacred tobacco and cultural traditions can lead to healing for Anishinaabe and Dakota people in Minnesota. These episodes are inspired by dedicated leaders who are doing this work. Over the summer, we've had opportunities to have several conversations about sacred tobacco, healing from addiction, and health in Minnesota's American Indian communities. We begin our series with conversations with Chris Matter, Senior Program Manager at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota, and Coco Villaluz, Senior Community Development Manager for Clearway, Minnesota, to get some background on how mainstream organizations and Native American communities are working together to reduce commercial tobacco use. Let's start with Chris Matter from the Center for Prevention to get some background on commercial tobacco control work. She shares what led her to this work and how mainstream organizations have had to learn and change in order to be effective in this work. I'm Chris Matter. I'm a senior program manager at the Center for Prevention at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota. My focus of work here is in the commercial tobacco control and prevention area. Um, I have been in the commercial tobacco control area for almost 16 years now. I uh, originally entered into this work through a funder role and I've continued to do that funder role as program manager. Initially, when I started in commercial tobacco work, my introduction to it was not through public health, but I saw it as a passion and a social justice issue. It was around looking at who is our opposition, and I would say the tobacco industry, continually continuing to target communities that bear the greatest harm as a result of commercial tobacco use. Um, and so seeing that as a way I could plug in and organize and be part of this work to create that change, really about improving people's lives. The health of their lives, um, commercial tobacco impacts people financially, health, emotionally, spiritually. So how can we create better lives for people? So actually my work with tribal communities and commercial tobacco um, work, community work, um, was probably from my first introduction in working in this issue for a mainstream organization. And I have always worked at a funder level. Um, I've always seen my role as an organize, organizer within a mainstream organization to move this issue forward. And so 16 years ago, when we were working with um, organizations that serve the American Indian communities and the urban communities here in the Twin Cities, along with some of the tribal nations here in Minnesota. Um, initially, we always talked about tobacco control and prevention, and the focus was really around policy work. Um, I would say as a mainstream institution, and myself as someone who um, is on a constant journey of learning and listening, um, started to understand more um, when working with communities, understanding traditions and their experience with tobacco. And it really became evident if you sit down and listen and talk to people, you will learn that tobacco is a traditional practice custom, it's sacred me medicine, um, it's ceremonial practice for um, the Dakota and Ojibwe Anishinaabe here in Minnesota. 
And so that became um, an important role that um, as mainstream funders, we needed to understand and we needed to think about that more clearly. Our understanding was not good at all. And so we needed to really improve and listen and learn. We needed to understand not just about commercial tobacco, traditional tobacco, and the way that um, indigenous peoples, their way of life with tobacco, but also to um, understand how that interplays with commercial tobacco and how the work is done in community. So one of the things I think that, that I've grown to understand is that to work with communities is just not to understand an issue here and now, but it is to have a greater understanding of history and their community's experience, and in particular with Native Americans and the history of the development of this of the United States and understanding um, literally the colonization and the history of tobacco, understanding even the American Indian Religious Freedom Act that just um, came in place in the 1970s. And so as a mainstream organization, someone who worked in that organization, we needed to teach ourselves that history. It was about us understanding. It wasn't about constantly taking from the communities. Um, and so as we entered into work, originally a lot of the work was around policy and going tobacco free. Well, that's disrespectful. If we just think about the language we're, le we're using um, with Native American communities as a mainstream organization, saying we want to fund work in communities to take your spaces tobacco free. Well, that is disrespectful if tobacco is a first medicine for the communities that we're hoping to partner with and work and go down this journey together. We all have different roles in the work. And so that is really, I think it's incumbent upon the mainstream organizations to check ourselves and to constantly be saying, wait, what is the language? Are we, are we respecting history? and people's knowledge um, around this, around traditional sacred medicines. Yeah, so in talking about our learnings and working with um, Native American serving organizations in the urban Minneapolis Twin Cities area, along with the 11 tribal nations in Minnesota, um, learnings in our work with the major um, commercial tobacco funding initiatives here in the state are the Minnesota Department of Health, Clear Way, Minnesota, and the Center for Prevention at Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Minnesota, we have partnered together and collaborated, collaborated as funding organization in the state for years now, and that it is a way for us to best serve, best serve the community and leverage our resources also as funders. And we have, over the years, also shared, collaborated, and talked many times around how we as organizations need to shift on the issues of, of commercial tobacco and under understandings of traditional tobacco also. We do coordinate our funding initiatives and through that have had dialogues around how we continue to learn, learn from past funding initiatives, what went well as we worked one-on-one um, -on -one with project coordinators, um, as, we, as we worked with organizations and tribal nations of funding policy, branching out and saying, no, we should be funding activities that are important to the community. What do we actually fund in expenses that typically would not have been funded by our organizations? And so then through our three organizations, we always try to not, we share our learnings and then change our practices around what we are and are not funding so that we can best serve the work around reducing commercial tobacco um, in the Native American community here in Minnesota. The collaboration among the Center for Prevention at Blue Cross, Clearway, Minnesota, and the Minnesota Department of Health has been necessary to address the damage that the commercial tobacco industry has caused, especially in Native American communities. Chris mentioned how these organizations work together. Here's Coco Villaluz from Clearway, Minnesota, talking about some specific approaches. My name is Coco Villaluz. I work for Clearway, Minnesota in the Community Development Department. I am a Senior Community Development Manager. 
first I'll just start with Hayaka no Ashite, Imagi Ab Isukumaki. I just want to thank you for this opportunity and uh, first preface that um, I am sharing the information that I know and am allowed to speak about. And so, in terms of tobacco and historically how it's played out in Minnesota, um, really acknowledging the two different cultural groups that exist. We have um, the Dakota and the Anishinaabe tribal communities, but in the urban area, we have over 500 some tribes represented. So we want to definitely acknowledge that um, there are many different tobacco creation stories and um, the way people use it. Um, and our goal and mission has always been to respect the original intention and know that um, it is governed by spiritual use for cultural ceremonial protocols. It is not something that we take lightly. We definitely, you know, treat it as a baby sometimes. And when we use tobacco, it's whether we're offering it to the water for prayers, when we're asking an elder um, for wisdom, there's a lot of different uses and everybody has their own relationship with tobacco. And so that has been our goal. And in a lot of our work, we talk about the two tobacco ways that exist in Indian country, um, the traditional versus the commercial tobacco use. So that is something that we make sure is a foundation in how we talk about this work. So um, from the beginning of time, we've learned that uh, tobacco has been part of the creation stories. There's different teachings around these. And so tobacco has been something that's been so honored and revered um, from the beginning of time. But as policy started to change within our U.S. government systems, a lot of our families and lands were forcibly removed from us. And um, with that, there has been a lot of historical trauma. And that's something that we definitely like to talk about because so often in today's age, we hear about you know the high rates of death and disease. Well, we have some of the highest rates of commercial tobacco. In Minnesota alone, the um, Minnesota American Indian rate is 59%. So you think about that and you're like, well, if it's something so special and, and you know honored, why do we have such high commercial rates? And we really get back to um, the historical trauma in terms of thinking about boarding schools. A lot of our family members were forcibly removed from their homes. And you know we talk about children being killed kidnapped at very young ages and where you're not allowed to talk your language, where you're not allowed to, you know, hunt and harvest your own food, where you are forcibly taken off of your traditional homelands and put on places that, you know, was not very plentiful and fruitful for your foods, where you are, you know, deemed to get these government ration, rations where that leads to, again, high rates of obesity. And so it wasn't until 1978 when the American Indian Religious Freedom Act passed that we were allowed to practice our spirituality out in the open. So you think about that, that's only um, 39 years ago. And, you know, we weren't allowed to have our medicine. If I were to carry my pouch of tobacco with me, I could have been, you know, jailed or something worse. So if you think about that in terms, there's a lot of healing that is um, has to happen. But we are so thankful because a lot of our ancestors and their teachings talk about they carry these traditional tobacco teachings kind of underground and hiding in plain sight. Um, and you hear a lot of stories where part of rations before or even going into the military, you were given um, cartons of cigarettes. So they still use that tobacco in those cigarettes to say their prayers because that was, you know, a form of access. And so you think about all these underlying things that had to happen to continue having these teachings today. And so where we are today, it's pretty cool because you're seeing this resurgence of traditional tobacco. It was never lost. It just had to go underground for a while. Um, but our ancestors kept those teachings alive. So as um, a person who my colleagues and I have searched into the tobacco industry um, documents, we've done a deep dive and really looking at how they utilize American Indian imagery and the medicine itself to create this mass product who we know many people are addicted to. Um, you see our different images from you know the early 1900s, 30s, where they're using you know images such as the war bonnets, the different headdresses, even the sacred pipe, and so often these images are so revered that you wouldn't necessarily just put this on a picture, let alone for marketing. And so in a lot of these tobacco industry documents, we were searching um, for you know, what the tobacco industry had to say. Some of the 
advertisements that we have found were very stereotypical, where they were making fun of um, you know American Indians and using this very stereotypical language and basically exploiting our um, sacred ways and our medicine. And then now you're seeing in some of the current tobacco industry products where there's different policy statements out there that talk about their you know reverence for American Indian communities and they're basically honoring um, you know this medicine that was given and um, so kind of putting this marketing spin to generate more of um, interest for um, kind of your earth you know not earth loving um, let me, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the way um, to market it to you know people who have a care for the environment and um, you know really utilizing that spin and there's actual policy statements in the industry documents and then when they're talking about specific images talking about how um, you know they're honoring this medicine and the sacred pipe and the people who you know had introduced the world to tobacco we are from this land and you know we were the first citizens of this land so to have been treated in such a way and still to this day there are a lot of things that still continue to happen you know when we just talked about the american indian religious freedom act um, when it relates to tobacco there are so many um, laws and policies that were not good so when we're talking about how we've done this work and you know even using the terms policy you have to do a lot of education around that because um, you know policy definitely is basically one of our mentors always talks about um, policy is riding the way that we want to live and a lot of us in our communities want to get back to you know these healthy ways we, we're seeing a lot of um, these cultural teachings whether it's relating to the canoes or even harvesting our own traditional medicines and, and growing that because again it wasn't until 78 that we were allowed to do that out in the open um, you know so often when we're doing this work you see people saying, you know, we have the highest rates of death and diseases in our community, but we're trying to shift that paradigm and saying, hey, we're the number one, you know, in health. And, and so a lot of the education has been around shifting that change and not always focusing on the disparities. We know it exists. We know that smoking, um, you know, commercial tobacco causes a lot of issues in our communities, but our communities are really talking about let's talk about traditional tobacco and what it means and how it has the power to help and heal. In terms of education, because now there has been funding to focus on this, there has been um, teachings, a lot of our cultural ways and ceremonies still have that connection to tobacco. It um, just has been harder to get access to the traditional tobacco that we would go out and find along the river or that we would grow ourselves because we were not allowed to do that. So um, it hasn't necessarily started five, 10 years ago, but there's been a really a resurgence to growing um, the traditional medicines. So in terms of reclamation of traditional tobacco, it is something that I'm so proud and honored to say that um, our ancestors have held on to these teachings for so long. I don't feel that we can emphasize that enough because so often we hear, you know, that we've lost it, um, but we haven't because the fact that I'm able to even be here and talking with you all, it was never lost. It just had to go in hiding. And, and so often um, our community members talk about that and you hear these stories that are allowed to be shared and, you know, these teachings. And I'm so happy that you all talk about the Reclaiming Sacred Tobacco documentary because a lot of those um, people in the documentary were, I, I would say, very brave in talking about a lot of their own historical, historical stories. I remember one of our elders back in my community um, would talk about when he was a little kid and, you know, even trying to play with cars, he would get beaten. And, um, you know, when he was spoke his language, he would get beaten. And it's something that, you know, still to this day gives me chills, but we carry their stories and their legacies. And, um, you know, even when I was first learning about traditional tobacco, I knew it was something very special to me growing up. Um, but learning about all the different teachings, and I always uh, tell a story because we were doing this cultural cap back in Montana, 
And um, I was asking about one of our medicines, the red willow. And <laughs> I asked an elder, I made my offering to him because that's what I was taught to do when you're asking for a teaching, you offer traditional tobacco. And he's like, I'll be back. And pretty soon he came back with this big old, you know, armfuls of red willow. And he was like, taught me how to do it, you know, scraping the um, outer red bark. And then the inner layer of this bark was, you know, what we would call our medicine, which is the shinchasha. And he was like, okay, now you can't go to sleep until you, um, you know, do all of this. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I literally didn't sleep for almost two days. But in that lesson, he was teaching me so much, you know, about the value and the beauty and the sacredness of what this um, medicine was for us. And, um, you know, it, it is like a baby. I couldn't just be like, oh, I'm going to get back to it. I still had to cook dinner for my family, but I had to make sure I got back and, you know, took very good care of it. And you had to do it with so much love and respect and, and with good thoughts. And when we're talking about tobacco, those good thoughts have carried through, you know, from the very beginning of time to all of the policies that the government enacted to where we are today. There has been an amazing resurgence, I would say, in Minnesota within the past 10, 15 years, where we've seen so much change in um, some of our northern Anishinaabe communities before they would talk about because of um, you know only having access to Prince Albert um, commercial tobacco or cigarettes you would see people giving baskets of that at you know different types of events or ceremonies or funerals that that was part of their protocol but now you can go to these same communities and they have this beautiful basket full of the traditional tobacco that they've grown or exchanged with other communities in Minnesota so you're seeing you know kind of you know memories from the past that's carried through and so we're really excited about that but you know it's it's taken a lot to get there so often <laughs> it's just it's crazy to think about what the tobacco industry has done and manipulated to this medicine where they're making billions of dollars creating so much death and disease but you know people have really started to you know take this back and say we're done and we're not going to be supporting um you know purchasing this um product but again it's still uh, you know kind of baby steps we always honor we don't ever shame anybody who still has to go to the store and purchase that type of tobacco for you know ceremonial cultural purposes because it is the access um, it is still with good hearts and minds that they're getting this tobacco for um, you know what they need it for so that is also educational lesson we'll never shame anybody for doing things the way that they need to do but we're seeing a lot of amazing things happen um, there's always stories that we hear about you know the the tiny seeds when you open a traditional tobacco um, pod there's there's lots of little pods on the plants but in one little pod there's hundreds of seeds and now literally um, you know, from one of the teachers that live actually in the urban area, she'll tell you a story about how she got these four plants. And, you know, this little pod that she would show us holding in the hand um, has literally carried throughout the country of people who are now growing traditional tobacco from that one pod. So just the stories and the legacies. And she would talk about, you know, this plant came from the east coast one of the tribes the mohawk tribes from the east coast so just the legacy and the the, the journeys um of where this plant and the story carries so it, it's pretty cool and um we still have a lot of work to do but there's there's a lot happening so i just have to say the tribal communities in minnesota rock they are you know i would say pioneers in um you know, just helping us to understand and learn more about the different cultural life ways. And because of their amazing relationships, you know, with their teachings and being able to carry it through, we've seen incredible amounts of policy change in Minnesota specifically. At the core and foundation was educating around traditional tobacco. And through all of these different teachings, they started with different types of commercial tobacco-free, you know, outdoor spaces, whether it would be their powwows in their local communities, to where we've seen the first ever smoke-free foster care happen in Indian country, which is huge because they went, um, 
smoke free in their foster care before like the state did. And so that was very huge pieces. We've also seen a lot more commercial tobacco free spaces um, within their casinos, with even within their tribal headquarters, which sometimes could seem foreign to, you know, like the state of Minnesota because the state of Minnesota passed the uh, Clean Indoor Air Act back, to, back in 2007. And because tribes are sovereign, that did not necessarily apply to them. But our advocates are working just as hard. They want to see more commercial tobacco free spaces. So we're seeing a lot of uh, these different, you know, movements happening. And I think the biggest thing is the outdoor spaces where we've seen a lot of commercial tobacco free parks we've seen e-cigarette policies happen within some of their um, community events and spaces before the states um, have taken those approaches so um, you know sovereignty is also very awesome because they have the power to create the change that is needed and our advocates have been you know just really moving that um, one of the stories that we've always heard is um, some of the ceremonies they would tell us that's never going to happen. We're never going to have commercial tobacco free. And now um, they're seeing that across the board, which is really cool because they were like literally six years ago, this is not going to happen. And like, hey, this has happened. We're seeing changes. And it was led by a lot of their um, cultural leaders. I believe that the way that they have their relationships and their trust within their communities so often you hear that you know it's a family it's a network and and the way that they're able to do that within their communities and also i think a big part of it is having the support from different funders in minnesota like blue cross blue shield um clearway the minnesota department of health being able to support the communities to do the work in the way that it needs to be done and being extremely flexible um, in the strategies and um, you know I think that makes all the difference in the world. We also have done in Minnesota in collaboration with Blue Cross the Gathering of Native Americans or GONA for short to really focus on how we can help create um, healing solutions in our communities as well as strategic plans around tobacco, commercial tobacco. But in the end, it's, you know, what is our vision for healthy communities? What, when we talk about tobacco, what does that mean for our communities? What is this, the narrative that we want to write? And so often, um, a lot of our statewide media campaigns all goes back to the community. We don't move forward on any of our initiatives that we've done unless we've consulted with the community. From the brainstorming session that includes a documentary to you know, we have our billboards and our brochures and a lot of the information, you know, with the death, um, high rates of disparities. We talk about that on one kind of pamphlet, but then on the other side, we talk about the good, the, the language and, you know, how it could be used. And so that's something that I think we're always evolving and listening to the community of what their wants and needs are to help create that change. And, um, and I really feel that's been reflected in our Keep Tobacco Sacred media campaigns and, um, you know, the the visuals that you see, the words that you hear, to even the um, American Indian quit line that is now in Minnesota, that was done with focus groups, that was done with, we call it a master's level curriculum to help work with the coaches um, who are going to be working with American Indians. So I just feel that it's, uh, the reason that there's been so much success in Minnesota is because it's been a true relationship um, between everybody.
to Chris Matter and Coco Villaluz for sharing their expertise and to Annie Humphrey for sharing her music with us. Annie will be performing at the Indigenous Foods Expo in Duluth, Minnesota on September 21st, 2019. Find more information about that on our website. Funded through proceeds from Blue Cross's historic lawsuit against the commercial tobacco industry, the Center for Prevention works with organizations statewide to make healthy choices possible for all Minnesotans. By tackling the leading causes of preventable disease, commercial tobacco use, physical inactivity, and unhealthy eating, we advance health equity to transform communities and create a healthier state. Follow the Center for Prevention on Facebook to keep in touch and learn about future episodes. And for more info on this episode, please visit centerforpreventionmn.com slash podcast. That's centerforpreventionmn.com slash podcast. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota is a nonprofit independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association.